All right, on Sunday, I texted Sean Fantasy and I said, win or lose on Monday night, you have to come on and talk about the Jets. Um, normally, we just do rewatchables pods together and I feel like every time you come on this pod, you're either tortured or super excited about the Jets or the Knicks. So now it's Tuesday and the Jets game couldn't have gone worse and I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. I think last time I was here, I was screaming about Joel Embiid. And uh, today I'll be screaming about Robert Sala. So thanks for having me. Oh, let's go. So Robert Sala, I looked this up. He's now 18 and 34 career. There's 201 coaches who have coached 50 plus games. And he's 183rd in winning percentage now. He's in the bottom 20. <laughs> cool. All time. And it's, it's an amazing list, Sean, that like Hugh Jackson is on that list. Nepo baby David Shula is on that list. <laughs> Joe Bugle. Mike Nolan, the guy who used to wear a suit on the sidelines for the Niners, he's on that list. The one and only Romeo Cornell, he's on there as well. And now Patriots Big Shot legend. Bob Sala. Uh, are you out? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. They just got their asses kicked by what may be the first or second best team in the NFL, right? So, like, I can take a deep breath and recognize that they played a road game on Monday Night Football against an absolute juggernaut and maybe the best coach in the NFL. But, man, they looked not prepared. And their defense got their asses handed to them. They, he was completely outcoached, made zero adjustments. And obviously, I've been waiting a long time to root for a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers. And that was okay. That was pretty good, that experience. But the defense, which is, I think Troy Aikman used the phrase vaunted defense like nine times last night. Yeah. They looked mediocre at best. Well, you said this because you were texting our uh, inner circle chat. And you were like, I don't understand this Jets love at all. Our defensive line is going to be terrible. Why don't people notice that we we lost Huff? We added Reddick, who doesn't play. Uh, people are going to be able to run the ball. You basically laid out every single thing that happened in the game. So, you know, it's a tricky situation because the whole defense is designed around not blitzing and having a strong pass rush and having lockdown secondary. So for the last two plus years of the Sala scheme, it's worked really well because they've had Bryce Huff, who is an undrafted free agent who they developed into an incredible pressure guy. They've had John Franklin Myers, an incredible run stuffing defensive end. And Quinton Williams has emerged as one of the best defensive tackles in the league. They also had Quinton Jefferson last year who put a ton of pressure on the quarterback. They lost Quinton Jefferson. They lost John Franklin Myers because they couldn't, they, because they traded for Hassan Reddick so they couldn't keep him on the cap. And they lost Bryce Huff to the Eagles, who very smartly then traded Hassan Reddick, who was asking for a lot of money, to the Jets. Reddick didn't play last night, and they're otherwise down three of their six best defensive linemen. Of course they got their asses handed to them by a running back that no one had ever heard of until six hours ago. Um, Sala didn't make a single adjustment in the game, and they were playing a bunch of nobodies on the defensive line too. Undrafted free agents, like guys you've never heard of who couldn't keep up last night. So it was... a. Uh, you know, for, some, for somebody who follows the team very closely, it was clear that the defense was going to take a step back. The hope was that the offense would take a step up. Yeah. It just wasn't enough of a step up, I guess. I mean, eight consecutive scoring drives, that's, that, apparently that's a record for the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> Have you ever seen anything like that? <laughs> no. It was horrible. I thought they were trying to start the game, we're going to run the ball down San Francisco's throat and keep our defense off the field, seemed to be the plan. But they couldn't really run the ball. But they, they had that one drive where... And we were texting about it. It was like, oh, that's what we thought we were going to get with the Jets. Rodgers making quick decisions at the line. Wilson was open. And it just seemed like the right mix. And then it just went away and we never saw it again. I thought, so Rodgers looked better than Cousins. Cousins yeah. was a statue in that Pittsburgh game. He just couldn't move around. Rodgers could move around a little, but it wasn't the same mobility that he used to have. Now, he's also 40 and he's coming off a big injury, but... I thought there were moments when he just seemed like he wanted to get rid of the ball versus actually trying to zoom out and create time, which he used to be great at. I think the one interception that he had is pretty uncharacteristic for him where he was trying to force it into Garrett Wilson. And you could see it was because he was a little jittery in the pocket. He really didn't want to get hit. But yeah. man, his arm is still money. I mean, yes. he was making incredible throws that, you know, that free play touchdown to Alan Lazard and also that throw along the sideline to Alan Lazard. Those are insane. I mean, I've never, I've literally never rooted for a quarterback who could make a throw like that in my entire life. So watching that stuff was really fun. But you know, this is an offense that is coached by the immortal Nat Hackett, who the, the run, run, pass king. Running on first down 
on like nine of the 10 drives that they had in this game. What the fuck is he doing? That was the Red bizarre. Run Pass King, is that his nickname? I mean, it, I mean, it is to me and all Jets fans this morning. If if that guy was calling the plays and it seemed like he was, that was a just a masterclass in playing into San Francisco's hands because they had a really stout run defense and Brees Hall, who's explosive, was just getting jammed at the line nonstop. I think he averaged like 2.8 yards a carry. This is one of the most expo- explosive players in the NFL. So that was really right. disappointing to watch. And you spent a lot of money on the offensive line too. It was interesting when they brought in the backup and they were talking about how he was 20 years old and I was thinking he was like three and a half years older than my son. <laughs> that is true. Braylon <laughs> Allen, playing, he's a beast. Yeah, talking shit to the like grown men on the Niners. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> Kevin Wilds pointed this out and I didn't think it was true and I looked it up and he was right. Rodgers hasn't thrown for 300 yards since week 13 of the 2021 season, which was December 19th, 2021. Uh, do you want to guess what the number one movie was that week? I'm going to put all your interests together. Ooh, say December nineteenth, two thousand twenty-one. So there were some December seventeenth releases too. There were Wednesday, Friday releases that oh week. God, that's just late in COVID times. Um, it was right when they were like, "Hey, come back to the theaters." And meanwhile, yeah, there was yeah. a new strain of COVID coming out. Well, I'll give you three. Okay. Spider-Man No Way Home. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. West Side Story. Mm -hmm. And House of Gucci. (laughs) House House of Gucci was the one that really hit home to me because (laughs) it felt like that movie came out nine years ago. Yeah, I think that one was a November release. I will say Spider-Man No Way Home is the number one movie at the box office. Back then. Yeah, in yeah, that weekend. That, but that, I'm just the, saying, to put that in perspective, those were the three movies that came out during Rodgers' last 300-yard game. Was he an absolute kook by then? I guess he was, right? He was immunized and all that bullshit. Yeah, what's it like to root for somebody who could be described as an absolute kook? Interesting. Thanks for asking. Um, I, you know, throughout the entirety of him not playing, it hasn't been pleasant, but when he was throwing the ball, I was into it, man. I was like, whatever, what ayahuasca... You know, vaccines. Yeah. I'm not thinking about that. What I'm thinking about is darts down the sideline. I, that, that was just thrilling. You know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the stuff that he's done, uh, you know, in the public eye. But I, for a 40-year-old guy, even if he still hasn't thrown for 300 yards in over three years, it's clear that he's not over. He's not done. He's not cooked. I mean, the Niners are good. And he yeah. was able to score on them a couple of times. And he made Alan Lazard look like an NFL player, which is something that Zach Wilson was never able to do. So. I'm not like completely out on Aaron Rodgers. I don't know how you could be after that game. I do think they also have kind of a cupcake schedule coming up. So there's yeah. a world in which they're doing very well. I still think this is an ins- a deeply flawed team, though. And I'll be honest, you know what I really started getting nervous is when you started gassing them up like six weeks ago. And I was like, oh, no. Why is Bill on that? I think this that is was not the, good. I think that was the right instinct, especially after watching Miami, who got completely outplayed for almost that entire Jacksonville game and then would have been down 24-7. ETN fumbles, and then the game just flips. And then Buffalo is like barely holding on against Arizona. You know, it just feels like whoever can get to 10 wins in the AFC East makes it. The Jets' next three, they're at Tennessee. Tennessee's terrible. Home for the Pats and home for Denver. And I feel like if you come out of that 0-3 after that Pats game or 1-3 after the Denver game, there's there's some salad possibilities at that I, point. I was wondering about that too, if he could get, if he would be canned. It's a tricky one because I think the Pats are going to be a little better than people think. The Jets are also playing three games in 11 days. That's yeah. not, I have no idea why the NFL just, they have a 40-year-old quarterback and they schedule them to play three games in 11 days. They also have a lot of nationally televised games on the schedule this year. And if they're not good, again, that's going to seem very strange. Yeah, but that Sala, Pats game is a Thursday. So they go at Tennessee and then home for Pats like four days later. Yeah, that's not, really not ideal. The, I don't know. I mean, this is a, this is, if you, that looked like a nine, eight win team last night. You know, it just looked like a mediocre team. And if they are a mediocre team, you know, my prediction was that they all get fired at the end of the season and Rodgers retires. Like, is, is, does that seem right to you? What do you think based on what you saw? I'm not ready to go there yet. He had that one throw to Lazard down the sidelines that made me realize, oh, there's nobody quite like this guy in the league, right? Just a couple, he pulls a couple throws out that I don't think anybody else in the league can make. And it still, it feels like he can still do that. It feels like he can still go to the line 
and be like, they're doing this, so we should do this. I mean, this is what happens in week one and week two. The Niners just might be, their defense might be just awesome this year, and maybe we were not going to realize that for three more weeks. I think the Pats game is a little dangerous, and that that's the one I'm trying to figure out, especially the Pats are home for Seattle this week. Trying to figure out how real that Bengals win was. I, I read everything. I watched the game again. The defense looked like 2001 hats on the ball, everyone flying around defense, and they had a pass rush, which I, I had no idea they were going to have a pass rush this year, especially with Judon and Barmore out, but they do. And then they were really able to run the ball on the right side, which I don't think, Ramondre was, I think, one of the best running backs in week one, if not the best one. So the way they ran the ball against Cincy, I think they could do against the Jets. I agree And I think they you. could pressure Rodgers. So it's it's a little bit of a scarier game than maybe I was counting on. I thought the Pats were going to be reprehensibly bad, and they're not. I thought that there was one crazy moment, like a real sliding doors moment in the Pats game where Burrow threw the touchdown. I think it was in the second quarter that got called back. And then he threw another pass over the middle to the tight end that got punched out at like the six-yard line yeah. and fumbled. And I thought if they went in and scored there, the, the Bengals might have been rolling down a hill. I agree. And, and that didn't happen. But I was, wa- I was watching the Pats closely because I was like, I need the Pats to not be good for once in my life. And yeah. I was like, oh, fuck, they're good. This is not, this is really not ideal. And that was when I started texting you and I was like, okay, so the Dolphins looked bad and they pulled the game out. The Bills completely turned their act around in the second half and looked dominant in the second half of yeah. the game. And the Pats are going to be tough and they played hard for Mayo. And even though the Jets have a, a, ostensibly an easier schedule, man, every team picking them to go like 12 and five or 13 and four, that just doesn't feel right. It doesn't taste right somehow based on what they've done. Also, you know, Joe Douglas, who did pick Garrett Wilson, who did pick Sauce Gardner, who did find Jermaine Johnson at the end of the first round of a draft, you know, he also picked Zach Wilson second overall. He also waited too long to add a veteran quarterback to the team. He also has now taken two consecutive first round picks that I don't think are going to contribute to this team really all that much this year. And Will McDonald last year and Olu Fashinu on the offensive line this year. You know, it's like you used to say about Belichick. It's like you keep taking guys in the first and second round that don't contribute. That's going to catch up with you. Like th- those guys are not really playing that much. So it's a team the that thing, doesn't have as much depth as you want. The thing I didn't like out of all the stuff they did, because the Giants did a version of this too, where they paid draft compensation to get somebody who played the exact same position as the guy they just could have kept um, or just signed. Like the Giants could have just signed a free agent. Instead, they paid a pick to trade for Brian Burns. And then Jets just could have kept Huff and maybe even just also kept Franklin Myers. And instead, they paid a draft pick to go get Reddick. I don't understand the logic of that. I would never want to give up a second round pick if I could have the second round pick plus Huff. I think if you are a cynical Jets fan looking at the strategy, they felt like they built Huff out of nothing and they thought they could do it again with other guys. And so they didn't want to overpay for a guy who doesn't play against the run, who's a you know, pos- you know, positional switch player who only basically blitzes the court, you know, rushes the quarterback. And so they were like, we, we can find another Huff, we can find another Huff. And then they lost Huff. And then they're like, shit, we got to get another edge player. They kind of freaked out as a little bit late in the game. Howie Roseman, you know, just treating that, Joe Douglas. That's another red flag. Like if, yeah, if the Eagles want your guy, that's probably a, a, a red flag. I totally they have agree. Pretty good taste in players. I totally agree. And and Roseman, you know, Joe Douglas used to work for Howie Roseman, so I, that whole thing just smelled funny to me from the beginning. And all my Eagles friends, of course, have been taunting me about it all summer. So I feel shitty about that. That being said, I don't know. Given the schedule, given Rodgers, given Hall and Wilson, th- there are definitely going to be games where they're going to win thirty to ten. And I have just not seen a lot of games like that in my life. Actually, there was an amazing stat that I read which is that they had games in which they scored three offensive touchdowns just twice last year. And they actually scored three offensive touchdowns last night. So yeah. it's going to be a better offense for sure. Even Tyrod Taylor, he looked pretty slick last, last night in garbage time. I enjoyed that. I also enjoyed it. I've always liked him. I've always been rooting for him ever since he was almost murdered by the Chargers <laughs> team doctor. The, uh, I'm, I'm also not out on this Jets season. I think one of the things is they're built to have a lead. They're one of those teams. Where it's like, once we have a lead, we can run the ball, we can do play action, and then on defense, we can just, you know, rush and blitz and do all the sour stuff. So yesterday was the worst case scenario. Also, once the Niners realized they could run the ball, that's the most terrifying team in the league. When it's like, oh, you're letting us run for six yards of carry, and now you have to start moving guys up to try to stop the run. Great. This is what we're good at. So it might have just been a perfect storm. We've seen week one overreactions. 
I'm not out on them yet. Wilson and Hall are amazing. Can, you have can two I see awesome them weapons? They they are. The, the one of my big takeaways from the game, and this is something we've talked about a lot over the last two years. There was no Jets pass pass rush whatsoever last night, but Brock, Brock Purdy was was kind of slinging it. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he was. Good. Yeah, he good. They even dropped a couple of plays. Well. You know, the the famous stat of the Jets haven't made the playoffs since 2010, right? Yeah, so that's familiar. like winter 2010. I realized we first met and exchanged emails in 2011. Mm -hmm. And we've worked together since 2012. Maybe I'm the problem. Time to quit. Should I put in my notice this morning? No, may <laughs> maybe we just should have a more distant relationship. <laughs> Larry David quit the Jets. Did he I though? If, I think he kind of did. But if But if they go... 12 and 5 this year. Is he back in? I don't know. I, you know, like, like he, he's my dad's age and your dad, like it's when you hit your mid seventies, you just start, yeah. you start going, fuck it. So he's <laughs> claiming he quit, but I also think he watched a game yesterday. So I don't know. We'll, we'll get a TBD. Maybe he'll come on the pod. 